Well, this week we saw the premiere of the latest Star Wars movie, and from all indications, it lived up to its expectations from what I've heard. The Star Wars franchise has become the photo uh, prototype of what it means to be a market of franchise and create millions of so-called super fans here and around the world. We are going to explore now what it means for people to be a super fan and fandom in general. First, uh, our guest in this segment is Seton Hall University Professor Jose Lopez. He teaches physics. Ty Randolph is here. She's the chief marketing officer from Relentless Generator, a marketing firm, and also uh, the super fan that we know, Darren Silvers. We welcome you. Let's start with you. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sorry, before we go to you, Darren, let's check uh, Heather McAdams. She's uh, with us via Skype from Los Angeles. Hello, Heather, how are you? Almost forgot about you. I'm here, I'm here. All right, Heather is a filmmaker and uh, also a writer. We'll get right back to you in a moment. Let's start with the super fan. You saw the movie. I've not seen the new one yet. You, Unfortunately, oh, it, is, oh, get it off, is impossible. Get off, get off the set if you haven't seen it. You're the super fan. I am the super fan, but unfortunately, the movies were completely blocked in. Uh, even even this weekend, if you try finding a single theater in the area that's so, that's, that is showing, it is completely blocked out. You cannot get a ticket right now. You cannot get a ticket till Monday. But you've seen the others. I've seen every right, single other stand one. Stand by. Ty, this is a franchise. Well, I, I don't know if you just saw it a moment ago. I don't know if we have a camera on it, but we had Darth Vader and uh, Luke here on the table. Two toys and they've fallen. But Ty, let's talk with you for just a moment. This is, this is probably the franchise movie uh, empire of, of, of all time. I mean, every time you say Star Wars, it's, it's probably easy to market this. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, what's so interesting about... Why don't you just, excuse me, just, why don't you just hold your toys, gentlemen? <laughs> Jose, you take yours, you take Luke, and Darren, you got, and we'll look at them in just a moment. Let's go back to Ty for a Yeah, moment. I think everybody wants a piece of the pie. We operate one of the stores, um, a, a, the Disney Music Emporium, um, and it's surprising the number of things that are selling around this franchise. So the official soundtrack is available on vinyl. Mm -hmm. um, the vinyl for the, from the previous film um, is, is selling off the shelves like crazy. And I think what it is, it's a combination of the nostalgia that it evokes. It's a multi-generational global fan base, um, so iconic, so many great characters. Um, and then the other part of, I think, the, the why we watch equation with this franchise and so many of the other great science fiction franchises is the ability for adults to be given the license to play and imagine the way that and we have do. it since we were children. And they, they dress up as the characters. <laughs> and I know, uh, Jose, you are a professor of physics, physics yeah. at Seton Hall University. And I, and I hesitate to ask. You saw the movie, I'm sure. Yes, I did. Did you movie. dress up as a character no, I when you went down? Uh, I, I, I'm not That's a where super you, fan. Okay. It's Darren. All right. <laughs> I'm just a fan. So uh, <laughs> tell us about the movie from the physics end. Did it all make sense to you? No, there was, uh, I mean, well, Luke Skywalker's here right now. Yeah. So that was the first question of the movie. Where is Luke Skywalker? That's what, uh, that's what I'll tell the fans. I'm not going to reveal anything except they're looking for him. Okay. And uh, it, But, but the, the physics-wise, yeah, there was a lot of issues. There's a new Death Star that, that sucks away a sun, and which is completely impossible. You can't mm -hmm. do that. You need a black hole inside your Death Star, and if you have a black hole, you're gonna suck the Death Star into the black hole. So there's a lot of baloney there. So J.J. <laughs> Abrams, you messed up there. But was that the only thing, or was there something else? Th th then, of course, the, there's the hovercrafts that they have there yes. that don't have anything under them. They levitate like magnetically, and I don't mm -hmm. understand how that's done. And then the ion engines that can just turn on in any direction and go around, and they work in the atmosphere and outer space the same way. And then the sounds they make in outer space, when you're shooting lasers, and we all know that, that the, there is no sound in outer space. All right, well, let's, let's, so talk, so many problems. let's talk with Heather McAdams. When you're writing these movies and you're, you're, do, you're creating these films, Heather, are you really thinking about the physics or about the visuals? Well, my dad taught me that the only thing I need to know about physics was F equals MA and you can't push with a rope. So that's not really my forte. <laughs> but uh, we do try to keep things as accurate as possible as writers because you want, you want people to be able to suspend their disbelief. If you make it too outrageous, then they're going to be thinking, hey, that's not possible. Mm -hmm. So you have to really walk that line where it has to be visually exciting, maybe possible, but not impossible. Right, right. You don't want people, if people are too focused on what, that that's not at all possible, you have bigger problems because they're not thinking about your storyline and they're not, you know, really attached to the, what's going on in your film. Or and I, I would imagine that there are some explosions in your movies. There have to be. <laughs> <laughs> You can't have a good movie without explosions, <laughs> exactly. right? <laughs> exactly right. Sometimes from behind or in front, but the person has to be thrown back in some fashion. <laughs> right. Am I right? Well, our, our current one is Desolation Sound, so we're dealing more with like severed feet up in British Columbia, floating in running shoes, so uh, no explosions in that one. 
Okay, let's go back to our super fan here. When you're watching the movie, yes. you're thinking the physics like Professor Lopez, you're just you. Absolutely not. There, there, is, there is a complete uh, suspension tension of belief, actually, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, e even though I know that if something, if something explodes in space, it's not gonna make a sound, I still love the sound. I love the feeling of, of the, the sound effects hitting me. I understand that, that the hovercraft, even though it's not capable of doing that, having it happen. I mean, this is Star Wars we're talking about. A guy choked another man through his mind. I don't think anyone can do that. But we still love seeing it because it is part of, of the magic. It's, it's part of, of what we love. You know, the preludes of the Star Wars, which came out one after another, uh, didn't get any uh, press like this, at least. Yeah. I don't know why that is. It was a Star, movies, uh, Star Wars franchise. But do you think bringing back the characters from the original movie is always necessary tie in doing something like this? Or can you leave them out? I think it's important. I think it's really important to create some consistency. Like, why do fans care? There's some reason to believe. And I, like I said before, I think the nostalgia piece of this one is what's so interesting. I mean, they introduce some new characters. It's an you know exciting sort of new storyline. From what I hear, I haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important when you're, especially when you're looking back for those parents or grandparents to introduce a franchise to a new generation. It's important that they have some points of reference. It's also good if you saw the first one or old enough to have seen the first one. You come, but when you see somebody like Harrison Ford and you realize that in that period of time he's aged we all have or you see Luke or Princess Leia and they have all aged mm -hmm. it sort of makes me sad when I see that I, or does it add to the credibility I, a little I bit time is it does, I don't know if it does and I don't want to say that you know I want to see young people in movies obviously mm -hmm. but you know when you see them how old they've gotten you realize you've gotten old as well <laughs> am I right Touché. but it's important to have them in the movie I think it is and especially from a marketing standpoint when you can pull from so many of the rich references from the previous franchises um, one of the things that we see again and again we're in the the sixth season for instance of The Walking Dead and helping market and monetize that IP. Mm -hmm. And every season it grows and it's because you have a greater affinity and a greater level of investment so that we see the fans become more and more passionate. Right. So I think it's important to bring back the characters and some of the plot references that they um, you know, were really so excited about the first time. Will you be dressing up when you see the movie? I will not be dressing <laughs> up unless you mean wearing stilettos. Okay. Little <laughs> Darren, will you be dressing up? And I'm gonna guess yes. Yeah, my, all my, right. my phone's in Ralph, it's all ready. All right, so what are you gonna be wearing? I will be wearing my commander outfit with a blue fringe around, mm -hmm. and it will be me and two friends as well, even though they've already seen the movie, because we do this as, as a group. We will be going, uh, I believe, in the Freehold Theater on Christmas Eve together. Now, wh what makes, uh, you know, you're a, you're a marketing expert, what makes people stand in line and in some cases camp out? a couple of days to see a movie. I saw this line and I said to myself, you know, it's going to be on DVD in six months. We could all see it at home. <laughs> right. You know? I think it's the same reason that people stand in line for at sports stadiums and, and wear the jerseys of the, the athlete that they love. They get to be a part of something. Mm -hmm. I think it's bigger than just the, the film or the franchise itself. It really becomes a cultural phenomenon. And I think you see people wanting to identify um, and kind of commemorate this moment in time. Heather McAdams in Los Angeles, is that the holy grail when you have uh, viewers who are invested in a movie and looking for the sequel and the sequel beyond that? Absolutely. Every filmmaker and writer dreams of having a franchise like that. I mean, you really want to be able to reach people and have them have that visceral experience. I mean, you see that big screen and those things are coming at you. You can't experience that at home the same way way. Uh, that's why people want to see it in the theater. And if you have people who want to see the film again and again, and they're having conversations about it, and then their children are watching it, I mean, that's what every filmmaker hopes to have, because when you, you ultimately want to reach people. When you write a movie, are, do you know right then and there that you got something on paper that's going to work and possibly be one of those franchises? Do you or any writers really know? I, I don't. I, I, to be honest, no. I mean, the best thing you can do is write the best story you can. And I think when you look at something like Star Wars, there's almost a Shakespearean element to it. You know, you have good versus evil. You have all these different archetypes that people can relate to. And it gets back down to, is it a good story? Is it compelling? And these stories are. And we've seen scripts that have been really good, but once they're put on film, they become clunkers. How do you translate that, a good script to a good film? Make that transition. Well, it's a team effort, absolutely. You have to have a good director. You need good actors who can make these characters come to life. I mean, do you think if someone else played Han Solo other than Harrison Ford, it would have been the same? Probably not. He added something to that that no one else could. So there's so many intangibles. You have to have a DP who can 
create these visuals. You need visual effects. There's so many things that go into making a, an epic film like this. Darren Silvers, and, how do you, uh, thank you, Heather. Darren Silvers, how do you describe the super fan, which you are? I mean, not only for Star Wars, but a super fan in general. Super fans are everywhere right now, especially with, with the internet, uh, mm -hmm. with, with social media, with, with so much going on. There, it's so much easier to be a super fan. Uh, no longer do I have to find a group of people in my local community and share with them in my basement. I can actually just go online, show, show them a story I've written, show them something I've, I've drawn, show, show them my new toy, and just, <laughs> and just enjoy uh, our time together. It is, it is a thousand times easier. Uh, your, your average super fan now is everywhere. Um, so what used, to be, what used to be pockets of super fans, now we have almost like a meetup of, of fans and it becomes a, a community. It becomes a full on community. Uh, there are so many communities right now. Star Wars um, has probably the largest community, uh, one of which being the 501st Legion. Uh, is an international community. It, it, there are chapters of it literally everywhere. Uh, is that from the movie? I don't know. Uh, yeah, Fire, the Fire Force, Force okay. uh, <laughs> is, uh, it's, it's a Star Wars community. It's a, it's a, they were named after the Darth Vader's um, personal, I guess, Guardians. troop. Yeah. See, I knew that. I was testing <laughs> I'm like, I was testing you for that. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're an international community. They are a, a costume enthusiast community, in fact. Uh, that's how they started back in the 90s. Uh, that's that's when I found them, at least. Now, Ty, do you uh, do you? I'm sure you utilize the internet, but to what degree when you're trying to generate interest and market something? Um, so everything that we do is digital, so we really focus on social media, on all of the fan forums, and it's interesting to see how these fandoms emerge. Uh, before I started this work, I had this uh, vision of this caricature, right? Like someone who was in their basement in costume, like spending eight hours a day. And, and definitely there are categories of fans who um, probably appear that way. Um, but to Darren's point, I think fandom has really been democratized with the, the rise of the internet, and it's easier for people to, you know, post a tweet or, or like a page and really express your affinity for a brand and it's easier for them to find folks with um, you know similar interests and passions so when we're marketing um, a film or uh, you know a new album we really look for those communities to help us carry the water and spread the uh, word. We have about a minute left Heather McAdams let me just go to you real briefly number one how is it being uh, received in Los Angeles and have you seen the movie and will you be dressing up it's actually three <laughs> questions. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't wear bonds today um, to Princess Leia. I will be seeing the movie, but first I want my son to see the first original three before we go see it. And yeah, for, as far as I know, the box office is going through the roof. They're breaking records. So obviously it's doing really, really well here okay. and elsewhere. Thank you very much, Heather McAdams, writer and filmmaker in Los Angeles. We appreciate your time. Final thoughts from the panel right here on Star Wars. You saw the movie saw on it. a scale of one to ten. It's an eight. Marketing, Ty, on a scale of 1 to 10. 11? <laughs> yeah, 15. It's been amazing. You can't avoid it. <laughs> uh, you cannot avoid it anywhere this week. I saw it anyway. And, and, and your thoughts on it? Star Wars is the best thing that has ever happened to the world, in mm. my eyes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Even the lunar landing wasn't as big as Star Wars. Nope. Wow. Nope. Even the Beatles, not as big as nope. Star Wars. <laughs> not as big. Okay, super fan Darren Silvers, thank you, Ty. Thank you as well. And thank you. Jose, you're sticking around for the next segment. We're going to end this particular segment with a funny bit that was on the Jimmy Fallon show. This week. <laughs>